this is Rachel from Red Ant Fashions. So I am staying with my little sister and I decided that's where kind of where I wanted to start my trip and my journey. Um, mostly because like a lot of the, like I would say where Red Ant really, I really gave birth to Red Ant, really originated with my little sister. It stemmed from the car crash in 2001 and death does really profound things to you. Um, it's interesting because everyone responds to death differently, but your own death definitely really impacts your life. And that was definitely the first time that I almost died. And I definitely felt myself slipping out of my own body, but it opened up something else inside of me. Um, and it really changed my life. And that's really where I gave birth to Red Ant um, and really started telling my own story through my art and really opening up and channeling my own emotions and manifesting it and giving it life. And Sarah was really much a really huge part of that. Um, after the car crash happened, uh, I was told that I was never gonna walk again and I would be in a wheelchair forever. And I was in intensive care for quite a while and they eventually gave me a blood transfusion. Um, and it was still touch and go and they didn't know what was gonna happen. And I was banged up pretty bad and I had lost a lot of blood and it, I was just a mangled mess pretty much. Um, and so when they eventually did get me home, that was what the doctors kept saying was, you know, you're pretty much like, we don't understand why you don't have spinal damage, but you're like, you, you don't feel anything from the waist down, like nothing works. And that was pretty much what their diagnosis was. Like you're going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. If you ever do figure out how to walk again, you're going to be on a cane pretty much. And you're never going to be able to walk normal. And they pretty much just set you up to expect the worst. I was 23 years old and that didn't really compute in my brain ever. And I was just like, that's just nonsense. Like, I'm going to walk again. They just don't work right now. And so I spent a, a long time in the wheelchair. But my parents both, though they both had really large houses that they owned, they didn't know what to do with me and didn't, neither one of them, I remember them fighting very clearly over who was going to take me. There was a clear sense of feeling like a burden with my parents because they both didn't want me. And I remember at one point, my mother was arguing with the ER out here, actually, in Ventura, after the car crash, because they tried to readmit me into the hospital. After I came back from um, Arizona, they put me in a nursing home, and that was just a nightmare. So the nursing home released me, and it was basically, I was an outpatient, and one of my parents needed to basically take me in and take me to and from the doctors and be an outpatient during recovery. But my parents didn't want me. Um, they didn't want me staying in the house and they didn't want to be burdened with a crippled. I couldn't go to the bathroom on my own. I didn't have control over my bowel movements or my bladder. I didn't have any control over any of my bodily functions. Um, nothing worked at all. I was literally, from the waist down, it was dysfunctional. Um, and so my parents didn't really want to deal with it. And so I remember my mom fighting with the doctor in the ER about needing to admit me. And he was like, she's not in critical care anymore. She's an outpatient. You need to take her home. And she was just like, well, I can't. I work. I can't be there. And I can't do this. This is too much. And the doctor yelling at her and then fighting and me just laying there on the gurney. And it was just the most like, it was the most surreal moment because that was kind of, there were so many things going on during that period of time, but that was just like, it was so brutal and it got so bad because they didn't know what to do with me. And both my parents were not going to take me home and put me in the spare bedroom. And so, um, my little sister who lived in New Mexico at the time, Sarah, she was the one that actually stepped forward and was just like, you know what? This is like total bullshit. I'm and I guess I will move into Rachel's apartment if she still has her apartment. You guys haven't let that go. I'm just going to move into Sarah's Rachel's apartment with my daughter and I'm just going to live with her and take care of her because this is like really retarded. Like you guys can't seem to get it together. And so Sarah actually moved in with me. They sent me back to my apartment and while my dad worked on the custody case of getting my son back, um, my little sister moved in with me and took care of me and so the next year Sarah literally did all of that with me and went through the whole entire process of relearning how to wiggle my toes and learning how to lift my legs and learning how to potty train that was a really big deal um, 
And she did all of that with me. And she went through the process and it was messy and it was emotional and it was intense. Um, it was it was a very bizarre time, but Sarah was really a big, huge part of that. And she was one of the people that actually pushed me to start doing art and doing fashion from my bed um, amongst other people. But she was one of the biggest driving forces where she literally would take me to the art store in the wheelchair and um, buy a whole bunch of art supplies with me. And then I would go home and she would just be like, you know, you need to start making stuff and start doing things. And she really kind of pushed it and really nurtured it. And so... And then we just came up with the idea, well, why don't and we We really with didn't know what we were doing with the fashion show, but she she was really part of that. So she was a part of that, that period in my life. And so I really thought, well, that's for me where it really all began. That was my first death and birth. I mean, it wasn't my very first birth, but it was my first rebirth in my life at 23 years old. Um, that was my first rebirth and, and the first near-death experience that I had. And so I thought, well, let's start there. So I'm staying with my little sister, um, and she's she's doing her veganism again. Um, she goes off and on this, but she's back on it. And so I've been kind of in a funk and depressed. And so she was like, come out. And I decided I was going to start my adventure here. And so I'm technically hanging out at her little vegan lesbian fat farm at her house. And she's detoxing me off of gluten and caffeine and sugar, um, which is an interesting process. And I'm attempting to flush my system and kind of detox well um, off of foods. Because I would say that's my biggest addiction. Um, that That is like what I'm addicted to is food. <laughs> food plays a huge part in my life. Um, so I'm doing that with her while reminiscing and I think I'm going to go on some adventures with her while I'm out here and kind of rediscover some of the places and stories that we have from growing up here and then I think I'm going to head out to LA and try to connect with some other people but I will keep recording and documenting and updating you guys and sharing stories and please feel free to share your own stories and if you like this video like and share um go to the YouTube channel and go ahead and subscribe to it and like it and share it because um, that really does help me out a lot with getting it out there and then as well if you have your own stories feel free to post it or comment below and share your stories I would love to hear what inspires you and what makes you tick um, share about your story why are you the way that you are and there you have it I will talk to you guys soon bye